Good morning. Welcome to CMC Markets on Friday, the 28th of October. And this look at the week ahead, beginning the 31st of October, with me, Michael Hewson. And by and large, um, it's been a fairly positive week for equity markets, or certainly a positive first three quarters of the week. Um, we are down currently on the day as I record this video. But ultimately, I think one of the main reasons that we have seen um, a slightly more resilient tone to equity markets this week has been um, the fact that yields have come down. They've come down quite significantly, despite the fact that we have seen fairly disappointing earnings numbers. You know, and I think that's that's the circle that I think some in markets are struggling to square because we've had earnings and guidance misses from the likes of Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook owner Meta Platforms face planted this week as its Reality Labs division continued to hemorrhage cash, certainly giving uh, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg a reality check for his Reality Labs experiment. Amazon, concern, as far as Amazon's concerned, we look quite likely to open significantly lower there. The stock face planted after hours, after guiding low on its pre-Christmas Q4 numbers. It also missed expectations on Q3 net sales. So what we've seen this week is a fairly positive tone to the likes of the FTSE 100, the DAX, but the NASDAQ has really, really has, has struggled quite a bit, as we can see from this chart here. Even though we did see a fairly positive first part of the week, yesterday we saw a big, big decline on the back of disappointment over some of those earnings numbers. So I think what's happening now is that the decline in yields and nowhere is that better illustrated <coughs> than in this UK gilt yields chart, which has seen a significant decline um, on the back of a slightly more benign uh, fiscal outlook for the UK economy. The budget has been pushed back from um, this coming Monday, the 31st of October to the 17th of November. Um, there was nary a murmur on gilt markets as a result of that. Um, certainly, I think the fact that um, the Bank of England and the UK Treasury appear to be singing from the same hymn sheet has appeared to settle things down. Um, and while it does slightly complicate the Bank of England's um, deliberations as we look ahead to next week when it comes to a rate rise, I think one thing has come out of it, or what has come out of it this week, has been a perception, perhaps, and this, this is just a perception, that some central banks are becoming an awful lot more cautious about the growth outlook and slowing down the pace of their rate rises. Earlier this month, we saw the RBA go by a much lower than expected rate rise of 25 basis points. And then on Wednesday, the Bank of Canada followed suit. Everyone was, well, most people were expecting a 75 basis point rate hike. We got 50. And then we had the European Central Bank raise rates as expected by 75 basis points. but the decision was not unanimous and there was also the fact that the ECB didn't pre-commit to do another 75 basis points in December which suggests that concerns about a slowing economy are now starting to get factored in to calculations when it comes to future rate rises. Which sort of brings me to the question as to why um, the US dollar has weakened this week, and obviously that has helped overall risk appetite. Um, one of the reasons the dollar has weakened this week, despite the fact that we are probably going to get a 75 basis point rate hike from the Federal Reserve on Wednesday, is that there appears to be some discussion about slowing the pace of US rate rises. Now, if you dial your mind back a little bit to September, Fed Chair Jay Powell indicated that the FOMC were strongly committed to driving inflation lower, while signalling that more rate rises were on the way. Powell went on to say there was no painless way to drive inflation lower. 
with the prospect that we could well see another 100 basis points by the end of this year at the bare minimum. Now, some of the data that we've seen come out of the US since that statement suggested that we might get 75 basis points in November and potentially 75 basis points in December. And that spooked the markets a little bit. But I think the discussion about 75 in December is starting to become slightly more nuanced, even though um, as recently as last week, Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed said that he saw little sign of the need for a pause or a pivot at this point, commenting back in October that the Fed would be in no position to slow down the pace of rate rises if inflation was still rising. Well, while that may be true on the core level, on the headline level, inflation does appear to be showing signs of moderating. Um, there's also the fact that there was some chatter that some Fed officials were becoming uneasy at the pace of the current rate hiking cycle. Thus far, apart from Fed Vice Chair Lael Brainerd, there's been precious little articulation of that until last Friday when San, Fran San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly said that after November, the time could be right for talk about stepping down the pace of rate hikes. So that, I think, that comment last Friday from Mary Daly suggested that there could be an early discussion that while the Fed is not likely to pause or pivot, rather than going for um, 75 in December, they could go for a lower rate hike. And that's good. And markets have latched onto that. They've latched onto that on the basis that potentially maybe we could only see 25 or 50 in December or 50 in December, and then potentially a pause in January or February. The downside to that is there's precious little sign that the US economy is slowing, even as economic growth elsewhere shows significant signs of slowing. So the Fed remains the elephant in the room to this current rebound in broader equity markets, NASDAQ notwithstanding. And I think that's going to be key. The next, the next few days, the tone of the Fed next week, obviously we also have non-farm payrolls, but obviously that comes after the Fed meeting. So that's important in the context of what might come in December, but certainly in the context of what the Fed decides on Wednesday, it's probably not as important. So wh where are we in the context of the current pullback in the dollar? Well, let's look at the dollar index. I mean, the dollar index has fallen and looks like it's going to fall for the second week in a row. So certainly I think there is a reevaluation or a reassessment of this current bout of dollar strength. We do appear to be getting a little bit of a pullback. And if we do see a weekly decline, it'll be the first time we've seen two successive weekly declines since July. But that doesn't necessarily signal a trend change. And I think that's important. What's significantly important over the course of the last few days, I think, has been the fact that the euro dollar has broken the downtrend line from the highs that we saw earlier this year. And it's also broken the 50 day moving average. So how we behave over the course of the next few days is, is, is expected to be fairly important in the overall context of where the dollar goes to next. At the moment, we've slipped back off the highs here around about 90, around about 1.0090, just shy of 101. We could slip back to the 50 day moving average and we could also slip all the way back to this trend line from here. But overall, the euro dollar does now appear to be finding a little bit of a base from just below that 96 area and 97 as well. So we could see a little bit of dollar strength over the course of the next few days, but there does appear to be some early semblance that perhaps the dollar may have topped. Similarly, with cable, we've tested the trend line resistance again from the highs this year. We've rebuffed, we've come back, and we could well retest A, the 50 day moving average, but also the trend line from the lows back in September. So there's also some evidence that the pound may well have bottomed in the short to medium term, 
medium term, certainly on the basis of these daily charts. So my bias towards the pound has slightly shifted. Um, we're still in the downtrend from the highs this year, but the fact that we've crossed above the 50 day moving average could be could be a positive indicator that perhaps we could see a little bit more sterling strength over the course of the next few days. Now, obviously, we have been helped um, by the rebound in the pound by the sharp fall in gilt yields that we've seen over the course of the past few days. But what's also been more encouraging has been the fact that natural gas prices, UK natural gas prices, have fallen quite sharply as well. So that is encouraging in terms of concerns about a slowdown in the UK economy. So the big question is, can the rebound that we've seen over the course of the past few days be sustained? Well, that's the big question. And if we look at the DAX, I think the DAX is probably going to be the key index that I'm keeping an eye out for, for evidence of a potential turnaround. Now, at the moment, we are still respecting the downtrend from the highs this year. And what's significant about this is for most of this year, the DAX and the euro dollar have correlated quite closely. The difference here is the euro dollar has broken its downtrend but the DAX hasn't. So that gives me a little bit of a pause when it comes to where we head to next. Is the euro dollar a leading indicator for a DAX rebound or is the euro dollar breakout um, a false positive when it comes to broader, the recent broader strength in European equity markets? So I'll be looking at these two over the course of the next few days to see whether or not we can get a break higher on the DAX um, with, with the Euro obviously leading it higher. Certainly from the tone of the ECB earlier this week, there's not really an awful lot to be um, positive about when it comes to um, interest rate policy for the ECB. They do appear, there, there does appear to be increasing divisions on the governing council as to what's likely to come on the rate front in December. What we've also seen from euro sterling is the pound really st strongly rebound um, from the lows that we saw at the end of September. What we're now seeing is a test of this key trend line support from the lows, but also the 100 day moving average, which is acting as support as well. So we could be starting to see the beginnings of a recovery in the pound. I think an awful lot of that could well be dictated by the politics at the top of the Conservative Party. If there is political cohesion on the part of the Conservatives, then we could well see further sterling strength. If, on the other hand, we revert to the type of the past six to 12 months, then we could well see these sterling gains quickly unravel. Certainly, the Bank of England meeting later this week is going to be instructive. I think in terms of the overall rebound in the pound, um, will the Bank of England go by 50 basis points or 75 basis points when they meet later this week? Um, I think if you'd asked me that question, say a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago, I'd have said they were going to be going by 75 basis points. Given the retreat or softening that we've seen from the RBA, the Bank of Canada, there is a prospect, there is a possibility that we could only go by 50. Why do I say that? Because Australia has a housing market that's looking increasingly vulnerable. So is Canada. The US actually has a housing market that's um, been struggling over the course of the past of this year. So could that be a factor in perhaps a slightly more softer pivot from the Fed this week? Um, certainly, I think in the context of the wider discussion, the UK housing market is struggling, not just on valuations, but also on the back of higher mortgage rates. So could the Bank of England go by 50 basis points because they're worried about upending the UK housing market? So we could get 50 basis points um, when the Bank of England meets on Thursday. So that's worth keeping an eye out for. As I say, 50 basis points is probably the least we can expect. Um, I think the odds of a 75 basis points rate hike have receded somewhat, even though inflation still remains stubbornly above 10%.
non-farm payrolls, um, probably going to see the lowest number this year on Friday of around about 200,000. We did see the unemployment rate drop in the previous numbers to 3.5%, but so did the participation rate as well. So there's not really much to see in there. Wage growth also remains fairly weak. Um, when I say fairly weak, it fell to the lowest levels this year at 5%. But having said that, he headline inflation is starting to come down in the US. So that's probably not a bigger problem as say, for example, as it is here in the UK. So to summarize the big events for this coming week, Federal Reserve on Wednesday, Bank of England on Thursday, non-farm payrolls on Friday. The earnings picture, been a bit of a mixed bag, um, certainly on a tech on, the, on a tech basis, they've been disappointing. Um, the headline numbers have been probably more positive than negative, but guidance wise, most, most of the numbers have been very disappointing. And that's really why we've seen the weakness this week in the NASDAQ 100. In terms of what to expect for this coming week, we've got BP. Um, Shell's numbers were very good, another $4 billion buyback. Um, BP share price has continued to hold up very well, hit another new highest level this year on the back of Shell's numbers yesterday. But obviously the thorny issue of windfall taxes has once again raised its ugly head. Now, it's important to remember with respect to BP, um, it's coming from a completely different place to Shell. It's still um, made a loss for, it's still running at a loss for this year, even, even accounting for the fact that underlying replacement cost profits of $8.45 billion in Q2 was a very, very decent beat. Profit attributable to shareholders was $9.3 billion, but that equated to a first half loss of $11.1 billion due to the Rosneft impairment. What we are expecting for the third quarter is unlikely to be anywhere near as good as the numbers in Q2. And what we can say, what we can say is that BP has taken an $800 million charge in this week's Q3 numbers in respect of the new windfall tax. So um, we know that you know, the discussions around the windfall tax or discussions, um, the the kicking and screaming around the windfall tax is largely political in nature. In BP's case, the fact that they've only set aside 800 million pounds, 800 million dollars rather, in respect of the higher rate, suggests that any money that the government makes from BP or the other oil majors is likely to be fairly small in nature. Um, and consequently, with an effective tax rate of 65% on top of, um, you know, relative to other sectors, the, the room for a significant increase is not likely to make, it's not likely to raise an awful lot of money. And that's, I think, probably reflected in the share price because ultimately it's based on their UK profits. But hopefully the direction of travel in terms for the shareholders is likely to be positive and looking for a retest of the highs back at the beginning of January 2020. So the share price for BP is still below pre-pandemic levels. Um, so that's BP's numbers, likely to be fairly decent. Obviously their cost base is a little bit higher because they have the Deepwater Horizon legacy, which they are still paying for. Uh, but overall, I'm expecting a decent set of numbers there, even though the shares are down today. We've also got Rolls-Royce. Um, their shares have had a really rough time of it recently, even accounting for the fact that air travel is now starting to return to normal and we and they and the company is now starting to see better revenues from if it's civil aviation. But since its Q2 numbers, the shares have been a steady decline, though we do appear to be seeing signs of a bit of a base in and around just below the 70p area. So that's um the, the Rolls-Royce numbers hopefully should give the share price a decent uplift over the course of the next few days. Retail's also fairly big this week. We've got Next and Sainsbury's. As you can see from this chart here, the next share price 
has taken an absolute nosedive over the course of the past, uh, well, year to date even. If we look at the year to date chart, that gives you a better indication of how poorly the share price has done, even though um, Next has said that it still expects to make um, profits of 840 million pounds, um, which, you know, by any stretch is still a fairly decent number. Um, Next is saying it expects profits to improve significantly in the second half of this year relative to the first half. I'm not convinced about that myself, but with the shares already back close to levels seen just after the first lockdown, um, hopefully a lot of the bad news is already priced in and we could see a little bit of a rebound despite the weak economic outlook. Sainsbury's. This is, this is an interesting one because earlier this month, the share price in Sainsbury's hit a record low. That's right, a record low. So lowest levels ever. 1919, 95, 2000, we've hit a record low for the Sainsbury's share price. Despite the fact that the supermarket chain still expects to make underlying profit before tax of between 630 million and 690 million pounds, which is pretty much unchanged from a year ago. And yet to look at this, to look at this share price, you'd think the, the shares were in the last chance saloon. You know, they're by, by no means anything but. Nonetheless, we've seen a fairly decent rebound off the lows in October. Um, so hopefully that will continue and we'll get a retest of the 50-day moving average, always assuming, of course, um, that we don't get a downgrade to that headline profits number. One item of particular interest, given the fact that we've also got numbers out from Pfizer, Uber, Robinhood, is Paramount Global. Paramount Global is the latest entrant to the streaming market. And I think that chart really tells you all you need to know. You can read all about um, my, my updates on the news and analysis section of the website. Um, you can also sign up to the non-farm payrolls webinar, which um, starts at 1.15 on Friday. But certainly I think this, this Paramount Global um, shares gives you an indication of the challenges facing the streaming market. The shares did get a brief uptick on the back of the Netflix numbers, but it's not been a good call to share price wise for Paramount. A new streaming service has sparked a slide to two year lows back in October. The company's still increasing its revenue year on year. Um, Top Gun Maverick, has done very well, so should contribute to the film studios part of the business. Certainly TV and film production, the numbers are expected to be good, but on the streaming numbers, Paramount Service, Paramount Plus Service has 43.3 million subscribers. Signed a deal with Walmart to help add numbers in Q3, but nonetheless, losses from ste streaming, steaming, streaming are still expected to approach $2 billion this year and are expected to increase in 2023. Now, you know, you, you can argue whether or not that's sustainable or not. Certainly Paramount Global do have other revenue streams um, like Disney, but their back catalogue is a, a lot, lot smaller. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not we get another disappointing update um, when Paramount Global release their third quarter numbers in the second quarter. But on the second for the second for the third quarter on the second of November. So that's it for um, this week. Let's so say just as a reminder, um, non-farm payrolls webinar. Join me as the numbers drop on the fourth of November at one fifteen. Um, otherwise, thanks very much for listening. Hope you all have a great weekend and speak to you all same time, same place next week.